anything like mine, in the past week or so, you have dug through the attic or the closet, wherever the decorations might be, and you've pulled out a variety of things, perhaps lights for the tree, perhaps a tree itself, for those of you who have the one that you can, you know, just fold up and store away. Uh, Perhaps you've dug out different uh, figurines, some stockings, garland that seemingly drops infinite needles on the ground. I'm I'm amazed that the garland has anything actually left on it after you set it up because of how much it actually drops. And then usually there's a box, at least in, in my home, that has a nativity. We have a couple different versions of the nativity that we set out in different places in our home. We've got a children's nativity that's made out of those little people plastic figurines. It's wonderful because if you have children, you know that the glass ones break. That's what happened to our first nativity set. We're slowly building back a glass set, but we want to be careful as we introduce that and put it really high up where even the balls and airplanes don't fly. In that nativity set, you you probably have something like the standard one, which has uh, Mary and Joseph and and generally a manger or they're holding baby Jesus there. Uh, Usually there's some animals associated with it. You've got a sheep or two, maybe a cow or a donkey. You've got a shepherd, maybe more than one shepherd. Likely there are many. And then you have set up on the opposite side of the shepherds a large camel which is usually one of the highlights, and three kings, each bearing their gift. Some nativity sets will have a star or an angel associated with it that kind of mounts on top precariously. And that's the set. That's the picture. That's the image that we have. If you see the nativity sets that are that are in people's yards, those are those are the general the, the general characters you expect to see there. What would the real picture look like? Our pictures are fairly sanitized. In fact, we usually wipe them clean before we set them up because the you know dust that gathers as they how do they get dust when they're gathered in you know stored away inside of a box i don't get that but we clean them up we wipe them off we set them out it's a fairly sanitized picture but what did the real picture look like when we put the harmony of the gospel stories together when we put the harmony of the of the stories of the nativity together we end up seeing those characters at different places but not at the same time In all likelihood, that first night, Mary and Joseph were there in the midst of delivering a baby, so silent would not be part of that process, typically. The shepherds came that night or the next day, depending on how you read the timing. There would have been animals, because it was a stable, it was a manger, What would that real picture look like? Perhaps today we'll get a little bit clearer an image of what the first nativity scene had entailed. We're in the Advent season. The Advent season is the four weeks that lead up to Christmas. We're in week three, if you're keeping track. And during the season, we're doing a specific series through Matthew's gospel account. We looked at chapter one the last two weeks. We're looking at half of chapter two today. The latter half of chapter two will be next week as we celebrate Christmas together on Christmas Sunday, the Sunday prior to Christmas. This Advent season leading up is designed for us to celebrate the coming of Jesus, to remember what was longed for prior to His coming, to celebrate that He has come, and to look forward to His coming again. So we pointed out the last couple weeks, Matthew, as a gospel writer, is heavily focused on seeing how Jesus fulfills All that was promised. Jesus fulfills the promise that has been made all along. Jesus is the promised king. He's the one who will reign on David's throne. He is the Messiah. And for Matthew, this is not a surprise like twist ending he's going to introduce. Matthew is not a suspense writer. He's not writing with this character Jesus kind of in the shadows. Who could he be? He just comes straight out of the gate telling you, Jesus is the promised king. So here we are in Matthew chapter 2, 
verses 1 through 12. If you have a copy of the Bible, I encourage you to open that up, turn that on. Uh, If not, the words will be here beside me. You can follow along as I read aloud. Hear the words of the Lord. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him and assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people. He inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is the word of the Lord. The main point that I want you to see, and I believe Matthew's main point for us here in this passage, is that Jesus is the true king. Jesus is the true king. The characters of Matthew's nativity are a little different than what we are accustomed to. We saw last week in chapter 1, we get Mary and Joseph, but there's not really a journey to Bethlehem recorded. It's not mentioned that they had gone there for the census. That's Luke's account. But we are introduced here in chapter 2 to two main characters or groups of characters that color the story. One character that I've never seen in a nativity set is King Herod. Uh, but but follow me here. He's got a legitimate claim to make a, at least an appearance there from a distance. I mean, the angels told the shepherds where to go to find baby Jesus. And who told the wise men where to go to find baby Jesus? King Herod. So I, I think there's, there's an argument to be made that Herod could have a figure in your nativity set. But before you go, like, you know, making stuff, post online about that and sculpting your own figures. Let's look at Herod for a moment. This is referring to Herod the Great. He's the second in a long line of Herods, it's a family name, that ruled over Palestine. Of Herod the Great, we have more first century documents than nearly anyone else in ancient history. Because the Jewish writer Josephus filled two book-length scrolls on the life and deeds of Herod the Great. In fact, Josephus is the one who calls him the Great. So we get a lot of information, much of it we would not care to know, but it colors the picture quite vividly, about Herod. The family's rule stretches the entire length of the New Testament. We find him introduced here in the opening chapters of the Gospels. As Jesus is a baby, Herod is established in his kingship, in his rulership. And we find all the way through the end, the ends of the book of Acts, a child, a descendant of Herod is still there in power in Palestine. Herod the Great was a brilliant politician and a cruel and infamous ruler. He was responsible for many things in Palestine. Coming to power, 
uh, approximately 40 years leading up to Jesus' birth, he rebuilt the temple. In fact, Jesus' encounter, Jesus is going to the temple. All the stories we get of Jesus in the temple, he's in Herod's temple. The one that Herod had rebuilt some years before. The one Jesus points and says, look at these stones. I'm going to knock every single one of them down and rebuild it again. He's pointing at Herod's temple. Herod built the port city of Caesarea, providing Palestine their first major seaport on the Mediterranean. He built many other cities and many other, uh, many other elements to the culture in that er- area. He was a brilliant politician and a masterful leader when it came to getting things done. He even gave the entirety of Jerusalem a facelift and constructed an impressive palace for himself. You can see across the entire region of Israel... Things dedicated to Herod, built by Herod, given by Herod throughout all the archaeological digs in the, in the area of Israel. But Herod's iron-fisted rulership is largely a negative. It did provide peace. Throughout the region of Israel. This is why Jesus could move around in that area during his ministry, during his life, without wars, without conflict, without having to to dodge from, you know, bandits on the road. Because Herod ruled with an iron fist. He was fiercely loyal to what he believed in. But if he didn't believe in you, it was not as nice of a story. You see, while Herod was a brilliant politician, he was also ruthless. He was cruel. He was deadly. He had many sons. He was uh, married to ten wives, if I remember correctly. And each one of them gave him at least one male heir. And of those, many of whom he killed. Because he saw them as threats to his power. Before breakfast was served each morning, there were plots going on behind the scenes. It, it, It was that type of dynamic in the home. Caesar Augustus, who gave Herod his position, once said he would rather be Herod's pig than Herod's son. Herod was given the position of the king. But it was in conjunction with the Roman governorship, all under the the edict of Caesar. The Jewish people had a strong dislike for Herod for many reasons. First off, Herod was not even fully Jewish. He was half Jewish and resented that element of his life. But as king of the Jews, he worked within that culture And claimed to be the king of the Jews. His kingship was given by Roman authority. Which meant it could be taken by Roman authority. Therefore he always deferred to Rome. Rather than standing up for the rights and needs of the people. He was given to rule. He was brutal. Towards the people. Even his own family. In addition to murdering many of his sons, he also murdered who was called his favorite wife, as well as many other family members, uncles, cousins, anybody that he perceived to be a threat. Late in his life, as Josephus writes about it, clearly you see Herod is paranoid and begins killing people seemingly without cause. And toward his death, he devised a plot because he realized that people were you know, getting excited that Herod's death was imminent. He was sick. They couldn't find a cure. Everyone knew Herod was going to die and Herod did not want people celebrating at his death. So he devised a plot to arrest all of the Jewish leaders in Israel, bring them all to the amphitheater which he had built. And when he passed, they were all to be executed. Thankfully, that plot failed. Herod was ruthless. He even, after inviting the chief priest down for a swim and drowning him in the river, 
established another chief priest for himself. It, the, the supposed last installment of the Star Wars saga is coming out this week. It, I'll believe it when I see it that it's the last one because it just seems like there's always another one. Even you know, decades later, there's there's another one. And and here here's the thing: in the Star Wars saga, there's always somebody in that Sith line that bad guy line there's always some evil bad guy most of them have the first name darth and it lasts for generations that's kind of like the herod family in the new testament Oh, there's another Herod, and he's still the bad guy. There's another Herod, and he's still the bad guy. All the way through, the Herods are always opposed to Christ and his church. Beginning with Herod the Great. It's rather odd that he's called the Great. Because from a New Testament perspective, the only greatness of Herod is the greatness of his evil. In addition to this, we're introduced to The Magi. Look again at verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men or Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. These are characters with whom we're far more accustomed. In fact, as we mentioned earlier, they're probably part of your nativity set if you have one set up in your home. These are ones that we can recognize pretty readily. But what do we know about them? These men were considered stargazers. Magi is used throughout the Bible in a variety of ways, often referring to magicians who would be part of royal courts to give wisdom, to give advice, to help solve mysteries. These would have been well acquainted with the stars and gazing upon them. These were ones who were given the job of recognizing kings Part of the ceremony of of coronation. Being from the east, they're likely either from Babylon or Persia. Maybe even from the Arabian, across the Arabian desert. But notice how Matthew doesn't give them a number. All the way through, it's just the wise men, the magi. Your nativity, nativity set at home probably has three. And that's because the early church father, Tertullian, around 200 A.D., deduced that because there were three gifts, there ought to have been three wise men. And he's the one who first called them kings. If you fast forward to 600 A.D., you get the Armenian infancy gospel, which is not inspired biblical text, and that assigns these three names, Melchor. Balthasar and Gaspar. And if you fast forward to the 1800s, you find these three at the introduction to Wallace's famous novel, Ben-Hur. And you find them being from Europe, Asia, and Africa. It's funny how history takes silence and writes a story with it. But what do we know for certain about the wise men? Well, all we know is what's here in this text. This is the only reference to the wise men we get in the Bible. So what do we know for certain? We know that they came looking for Jesus. Likely it would have been a band, more than just a band of three men, but a large caravan led by the group of wise men, accompanied by their entourage. And while the camel gets so much focus in the nativity set, and if you've got a living nativity, the camel will draw all the attention, especially of the children, we have no indication as to their mode of transportation. A camel would make sense, being they're coming across the desert, but we have no clear indication from the text. The text does make clear that their journey was begun by the rising of a star. They saw the star rise. And the next thing we see, they're in Jerusalem saying, we're here looking for the king. This is a unique star. It evidently rose sometime around the birth of Jesus. 
its attributes and appearance indicated to the wise men that they needed to go and follow this star. The star evidently went before the wise men, at least from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, if not leading them day by day, step by step, all the way on their journey. Nowadays, if you file the paperwork and pay the fee, you can actually get a star named after yourself or your loved ones. God, at the birth of his son, gave a star. The maker of the star set his star in place. Just a little aside, there's a danger in this for us. Because there are numerous articles and, and conversations to be had about what was the star? Which star was it? Was it a planet? Was it a comet? Was, was it this? Was it that? You're trying to figure out the science behind what this star was. And that can be fascinating. But hear the warning. Don't get derailed by the star. In my opinion, I think it was a supernatural work of God. Similar to how in Jonah, it says the Lord appointed a great fish and we have no other details other than a great fish that the Lord appointed. I think here the Lord appointed a great star. But the point is not the star. The point is who the star is leading us to. The point is that the wise men saw the star, packed their bags, and they went to find the king. How did they know they were looking for a king based upon seeing a star? We don't even know that exactly. But we know they did. One other thing to note. Look at the timeline. Verse 1, it says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem. In verse 11, it says, Mary and, and Jesus were in a house, not a stable The time frame that Herod ascertained in verse 7 is revealed in verse 17 that we'll look at next week to be approximately two years. As John, who teaches our life studies, mentioned a a year or so ago, we're not talking about baby Jesus here. We're talking about toddler Jesus. The wise men went to visit toddler Jesus. It puts a whole new perspective on it, doesn't it? It, it, It... that, that little quiet, peaceful scene, Mary rocking Jesus slowly side to side. Have you ever tried to rock a toddler? That's not exactly easy. As a parent with four sons, when you have visitors and your child is a toddler, it can be a harrowing experience. I, I can remember we, when, when we had three sons that were three years of age and under, it was exciting. We went to visit my grandparents. And my, my grandparents spent their retirement collecting antiques. Their house was set up like a museum with ornate antique glassware and pots and furniture. And everything in their house essentially was an antique except for the food you ate. The plates you ate off of were antique plates. And we have three children, three years of age and under, and we're going to stay for a visit. We know that being fully God, Jesus never sinned. But I can imagine Mary probably raised her voice once or twice. As these magi, these kings walked in, in their ornate regalia, bringing their gifts and their treasures, and toddler Jesus is running around. The wise men display the international recognition that the birth of Jesus is the promised king. So the dialogue here is asking a question, who's the true king? That's what the dialogue here is driving at. That's what we recognize. When, when you read Matthew's account, there's almost a comedic sting in it. Do you hear it? Look at verses 1 through 3. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. 
when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Do, do, do you see how Matthew's playing on that just a little bit? Herod the king, the wise men show up and say, where's the new king? And Herod's like, uh, it's not me. You're not looking for those gifts are not for me. You see how Matthew keeps saying, the king. And he'll come and he'll say it one more time. He, he points to Herod as the king. Clearly, Herod is not the king whom the Magi are searching. Yet Matthew repeatedly speaks of Herod as the king. And did, did you notice how all Jerusalem was troubled with Herod? After hearing a little bit about his story, you can imagine why. New people showed up and they're looking for a new king. And everybody's waiting for the axe to fall, literally. Herod was known for executing everyone who challenged his authority. And these magi show up saying, where's the new king? But Herod knew enough to question whether this could be the Messiah. Because we see in verses 4 through 6, And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ, the Messiah, was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Can you imagine the panic of the scribes and the chief priests? Herod summons them. They know they've heard the rumblings that that some new guys are talking about a new king. They don't know what we're dealing with here. Herod's like, guys, come over here. Imagine the panic. Where's the Christ supposed to be born? They're like, uh, 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 you you had that one, right? Imagine the panic that ensued. They cite the prophet Micah, rightly so, because Matthew quotes him as well. The prophet Micah is cited to Herod. And Micah's entire prophecy would have been haunting to Herod. Because Micah is not a happy prophet. Micah spends the first three chapters detailing the destruction of Jerusalem and all the surrounding area because of the sinfulness of her leaders. But then in chapter 4, Micah paints a glorious picture of what it is when the people of God faithfully and rightly follow and serve God. How there will be peace in the land and there will be joy amongst the people. the end of chapter 4, he speaks of rescue, gathering his people who have been dispersed, who have been hauled off and taken to foreign places. How the prophet speaks of how God's going to gather his dispersed people and triumph over his adversaries. And then as chapter 5 opens, we see this in verse 2, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, referencing the Bethlehem that's there in the land of Judah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Verse 4, And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. This prophecy speaks volumes about Jesus. Bethlehem is the city of David. It's where David was born. It's where his father Jesse had lived. And it's where the son of David, the greater son of David, the one who has been foretold was to be born in Bethlehem. David is known both as a shepherd and as a king. 
And David's greater son here in this prophecy is seen both as the ruler of Israel and the shepherd of the people of God. This child is declared to be ruler, the ruler from God, one with authority and power, the king of God's people, yet he will shepherd God's people with compassion, with care, guidance, bringing them peace and protection. In Micah, it says that he is the one from of old, from of ancient days, pointing to the eternality of God the Son. And Micah also elaborates on Jesus' role as the shepherd of God's people, bringing peace to them. According to Micah, who's cited by the scribes and the chief priests to Herod, the king. Herod didn't fit the bill. Can you imagine the scribes and chief priests pulling straws to see who's going to tell them this? It's like one of those elementary mystery puzzles. As an adult, you read the elementary mystery puzzles and, and you catch on very quickly as to, as to what the, the solution is. Like, okay, it's long, warm, it's a tube, and one end is stitched, and you put it on your foot. What is it? It's a sock. Okay, okay. We, it, it's, it's like one of those things. You read all the clues, and you look at it, and you say, okay, the true king is not going to be judged by God as a sinner. He's established by God, not by Rome. He will bring the scattered people of Israel back in peace. He will be born in Bethlehem as the ruler on David's throne. He will be a compassionate shepherd to God's people. Even Herod gets it that this is not pointing at him. Jesus is the true king. How exactly the wise men knew they were supposed to be searching for the new king, we don't know. But they show up looking at Herod and say, nope, it's not him. Where is the newborn king? Jesus is the true king who has all authority and absolute sovereign rule, yet in His merciful love, He came also declaring Himself to be the good shepherd who lays down His life for the sheep. Jesus is the true King who came to serve His people, not to be served by them. He came to reconcile you to God by dying in your place for your sins. Rising three days later, conquering sin and death forever for all who will trust and follow him. So what do we do with the king? How do we respond to the king? Here in our text, we see two radically different responses. First, we see Herod, and we've already seen that Herod was troubled at even the the suggestion that there might be another king. The entire city is set on edge because Herod is troubled by this news. Verse 7 and 8 reveal more of Herod's response. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Herod saw the wise men as but a means to a political end. He wanted to use them for information and and essentially directions to eliminate the new threat to his throne. Herod wanted to protect his own crown at all cost. And we know from reading the rest of the story in chapter 2, which we'll look at next week, that he had murderous intent. His immediate response to Jesus as true king was to wage war against him. Even with Jesus as a small child, it was war against anyone or anything that threatened his crown. But is that not how we are all wired up? 
We resist any authority that comes in and says that you're not in charge. We resist any sort of of accusation that we are not the king of our lives. We don't like it when people tell us what to do. We don't like it when people assert authority over us. As a human race, we all with Adam and Eve have rebelled against God and His rightful rule over our lives. And in that, we have tried to snatch the crown for ourselves. To see how it fits here. To wear it for ourselves. Trying to be the king of our own lives. But the problem is the crown does not fit. The crown does not fit us. The crown does not fit you. It doesn't fit me. And we know this because our lives and everything we touch gets messed up as we try to assert our own rulership. Even more profoundly, God will not allow rebellion against His rightful rule to endure. God calls this sin a rebellion against Him. And the punishment for sin is death. And after that, judgment. While Herod's response may appear to be self-preserving, it is self-destructing. Friend, do not rebel against God as your true king. Do not rebel and wage war against Jesus' rightful place as the eternal true king. King. But let us look to the response of the wise men. Their response is already seen in the fact that they traveled such a great distance to see toddler Jesus. Look at verses 9 through 12. After listening to the king, they went there on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. When the star goes before them to Bethlehem, They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. That's a lot of joy crammed into just a few words. It's four words in the original language, and it's lots of joy, lots of joy, great and exceedingly. That's that's kind of a rough translation of it. It, This is... It's quite the description of their happiness. This is like when the Heat first won the championship in the NBA. I mean, there were people cheering in the streets, yelling and shouting. I even heard stories of some who were banging pots along the side of the road. I can imagine that the wise men were high-fiving each other as they rode the five miles from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, cheering and celebrating and rejoicing that they are nearing the goal of their quest. And as they entered the house, their immediate response was worship. This too makes me wonder, was was there even an introduction? Did they walk in and immediately fall down and worship before this young boy? Their joy in finding the true king immediately translated into worship of the true king. Their celebration over the success of their quest was quieted by their awe and reverence for the object of their journey. The treasures the wise men brought again point to who Jesus really is. They brought gold, the gift of a king, a royal gift. We're not told how much, we're not told you know, what it was carried in, but we know that they brought this gift of gold, the gift that would be given to the true king, King Jesus. 
They also brought frankincense and expensive spice and perfume. This was prescribed in the days of Moses for the worship of God in the Holy of Holies. In the tabernacle. Frankincense was used in the worship of God, pointing to the fact that Jesus is fully God. Myrrh, the strong perfume, a deodorizer used in the ancient world for embalming dead bodies. Jesus took on flesh that he might die for the sins of the world. You and I, in our rebellion, tried to steal the crown trying to live life our own way, trying to live by our own rules. We have all rebelled against God. We have sinned against Him and stand under His judgment. Yet God in His love sent the true King. The one who always lived perfectly. The one who always obeyed God. The one who always fulfilled God's perfect plan and design. He is the true King. Established by God. Because He is fully God Himself. Jesus came as fully God and took on human flesh, becoming like us, that he would die for us. He died the death you deserve. He died for your sins and for mine. Conquering them on the cross, he declared, it is finished. And rose again three days later. So that you could be forgiven your sins. And granted his perfection. This all comes by faith. By trusting him. Rejoice today in Jesus your true king. Worship him by obeying and following him. Following him. Honoring him in all that you do. What does it look like to respond rightly to Jesus? Let me suggest just a few things to you. First, like the wise men, seek him. Search the scriptures that you would know more of who he is. Seek after Jesus. Seek to know him in the pages of the Bible. Secondly, rejoice as you grow closer to him. God does not call you to himself to come under the reign of Jesus for your detriment or your sadness. He calls you to your deepest and eternal joy. Rejoice as you draw near to your king. And thirdly, worship him. Worship him as the one true king. Worship him as fully God. Who has become fully man. And worship him as your savior. The one who has sacrificed himself to bring you to God. This Christmas, seek Rejoice and worship the true king. So Matthew's nativity set looks a little different than ours. If Matthew had set it up, he would have put the wise men probably in another room on their journey. Herod would have been sitting a few feet away, angry. But the details point us to the fact that Jesus is the true king. He fulfills perfectly all that was foretold of him. And the question for you and I today is how are you responding to Jesus? How are you responding to Jesus Don't respond by trying to guard or defend your own crown. It doesn't fit. It looks bad. And leaves you under the judgment of God. Turn. And trust in the one true king. Turn and trust in Jesus. Submit to him, follow him as your true king, and there you will be filled with joy. Heavenly Father, thank you for King Jesus. 
Thank you that while the wise men sought to find him, he's come near and you have revealed him to us through your word. Father, I pray that we would all, as individuals and together as a body, submit to Jesus as our King. That we would obey Him and follow Him. That we would seek after Him, rejoice in Him, and worship Him. Father, would You work in each of our hearts now as we respond to You. For Your glory and our joy, would You draw us near to King Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.